I had a group of students this week who wanted to make a game that was a clone of shell shockers that you see here. You move these eggs around, it's kind of a cartoony first person shooter. So we looked at how we might do some of that with P5JS and JavaScript. Uh, so we explored various things. Here's a, here's a program that um, has a bunch of eggs and one egg at a time is selected and if it's selected then you can make it jump or you can move it around. You can move it around fast and you can pick another egg and move that. Make it jump. You can even make them uh, jump If you're quick enough, you can get them all to jump at once. Um, let's look at how this program works. Here's the code. It's, as I said, P5JS and JavaScript. And this is the single sketch file. There is a setup function that creates the canvas and puts this into 3D mode using this renderer. And this smooths the, smooths the edges using anti-aliasing. And this creates a bunch of positions for eggs. So the leftmost egg is at negative 300. Let's just reload it. And the rightmost egg is at plus 300. And we create a vector with these x, y, z coordinates. And we build this array of the positions of the eggs. That's how we keep track of where everything is. Then when we draw, the background, as you can see, is light blue. And there's, um, the way the selecting the egg works is you push a number on the keyboard here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. And when I push that button, this variable changes the selected player. And this is, the number of the selected player minus one. So if you push one, then selected player is zero. And that's because we, um, we usually start counting at zero in programming languages when we work with arrays and lists and collections. This line here finds the position of the selected player. So you remember positions, I'm pressing F4 in idea here, it takes us to here. Positions is the array of XYZ coordinates, these vectors, P5JS vectors. And selected player is the index of the selected player, so we get the position of the selected player. And then we call handle input. And I'm going to press F4 here and go into that. We're in the same file now, just scroll down a little bit. This is the handle input function. If no key is down, then we return without doing anything. Otherwise, we look to see if a number key is pressed. And if we have pressed a number key, then we set the selected player to that number minus one, as I had described before. If we don't have a number key, then we look at the other keys. And they can be held down simultaneously, many of them. You could hold down um, up and right and then you would move farther away and to the right at the same time. Uh, key is down simply returns whether or not the given key is down. And if that key is down, then we modify the part of the position vector. So if we're going up and down, we're moving on Z. We're moving farther away from us or closer to us. And the up arrow makes it move farther away from us, which means we decrement, we decrease the value of z. The shift multiplier allows you to move faster. If I hold down shift and press the up arrow or the, or the down arrow, here's the up arrow, here's the down arrow, then it moves much faster. Without shift, it just goes at this speed. That's a handy way to um, have two different speeds, like running. And the way it works is if the key is down, the shift key, then our multiplier is 10, otherwise our multiplier is 1. And if we multiply by 1, then that doesn't change it. So we either have 3 or 30 for these values here. 
the space key starts a jump. And if, you, if the selected player is not in the middle of a jump, then we'll start a new jump. Now I'm going to go back to where we called handle input from, and that's here. And now let's talk more about the draw function. You may have noticed that we can rotate the scene a little bit with the mouse. So with the mouse going from 0 to the canvas width minus 1, we rotate from um, a sixteenth of a turn um, clockwise as looking from above to a sixteenth of a turn counterclockwise as looking from above. And that's done with rotate Y and we're using the mouse X and we're using this C map which is my own constrained map function that uses P5's map function but just make sure that the values don't go beyond what is expected. For example, you mouse X can become greater than the width, but I constrain it to be ignored or treated as the maximum value if it goes beyond the maximum value. So that's what the CMAP, constrained map function does. It just calls map, but before it provides the input, it constrains it by not letting it go below that and not letting it go above that. Okay, going back now. Uh, so that explains uh, generally how that rotation works. Now we have a loop to draw those kind of um, stripes here that you see. And we start at minus 500, we end at plus 500, and we space them 50 units apart. We do push and pop so that the translations and rotations don't interfere with one another. We translate to the X position and we move down a little bit on Y and then we rotate. Um, let me show you what it looks like if we don't do this rotate X. It's like this. If you just make a plane, it's going to look more like a wall than a floor. So I rotate by a quarter of a circle. 90 degrees if we were using degrees instead of radians. Then we draw the plane and that draws those stripes. Next, the we, we use a light. You notice that there's a light coming from the left. That's done with directional light. And the eggs are, have an ambient material of white. So if you shine a white light on a white egg, you get white. These first three numbers for direction of light are the color, and these are the direction of the light on X, Y, and Z. Now we'll draw all the eggs. And the positions of the eggs are stored in this positions array of P5 vectors of coordinates. And this kind of loop gives us each position in turn. It also gives us an I, which is the index of the array element, starting with zero. Also remember that the selected player is the index of the selected player, and that starts at zero. So when I matches the selected player, that means we're drawing the selected egg. And for the selected egg, we stroke in white, otherwise we don't stroke. The selected egg has the strokes, so you see the triangles that make up the outside of the egg. The other ones don't have a, a stroke. Then we, inside a push and pop, because we're doing a bunch of them in a loop, we don't want the translates to accumulate. We do a translate. And what do we have here? This is the position on X, Y, and Z of the egg. And then this business with get jump height, that manages the um, extra height that the egg might have due to the fact that it may be jumping and where it is in the jump. So we'll look more at the get jump height. The, I use the mouse move function because I don't want to, when I load the page, Say I'm here, I load the page, I want the 
initial rotation on Y to be zero. I don't want it to just depend on where the mouse X is. I want to wait until I move the mouse cursor inside here before I start doing this rotation. It's just a nice little touch so you don't get that jarring effect at the beginning. That's why this is here. And we looked at handle input, and I think the last thing to look at is the get jump height. The purpose of get jump height is to raise the egg a little bit above the floor if it's in the middle of a jump. And then we also need to know how much time has elapsed in the jump so we know how high to go. And we use a sign function here to give us a um, sort of realistic jump. Let's go through this. Get jump height. This jump start time milliseconds, let me press F4 and go to that, which is going to jump us to the top of the file. So here's this. This is an array. It starts out empty. I'm going back now. And if the egg that we're drawing has a uh, value here, in other words, we're in the middle of a jump for it, then we'd figure out how much time has elapsed since the beginning of that jump. And then if the full jump duration of time has passed, then we know we're done with the jump. And if we are done with the jump, then we reset the jump start millis to null. If we're not done with the jump, then we calculate what fraction of the jump we have completed, a number between 0 and 1. Then we use that number between 0 and 1. Uh, we multiply it by pi. The units that sine uses, the sine function, is radians. And so a jump like this, imagine halfway around a circle, is equal to pi. Pi radians gets you halfway around a circle. This jump fraction is a number between 0 and 1, how far um, through the jump we are. So we multiply this by pi, and we get a number between 0 and pi. And um, the sign of that is going to be a number between minus 1 and 1. And then we multiply that by the maximum jump height. That's how that works. And I think that is all of it. Here's the program on GitHub. DC Brichetti P5 jump example. See you next time.